incidentally obtained information. So Mr. Pa uh, Mr. Parker suggested that to me a few days ago. Gone away and thought about it. Happy to uh, go along with that. The Honourable David Parker. Uh, Mr. Chairman, part four of this uh, bill for me is actually the most important part of this bill. This is the uh, part that confers but constrains the power of spy agencies to get warrants that affect New Zealanders and others. Sir, this is probably the most con controversial part of the bill, uh, and I want to talk a little about it. Sir, there are some changes that have been made since the uh, version that went to Select Committee, um, <clears throat> which I will come to. Um, but before I do that, there are, there are essentially two instances where, or two types of uh, categories of uh, warrants that can be obtained against New Zealanders, both of which are constrained. The first is where New Zealanders are acting as the agent of a foreign power. And this is found at Clause 55B uh, and applies where there are matters that are affecting international relations or the economic well-being of New Zealand. Uh, that's not enough. The person from, uh, from against whom a warrant is being sought has to be either uh, acting or purporting to act on behalf of a foreign person a foreign organisation or a designated terrorist entity. Uh, so that's not particularly new language. Um, there are equivalents to that in the, in the, um, in the current uh, legislation in relation to the agencies. Um, uh, the more, um, and, and that will only apply where a New Zealander is acting as an agent of a foreign power. Uh, we should be aware that a foreign organisation can include a foreign corporate. So if, you were, if there was a multinational acting in New Zealand, there is the potential for that to apply here. Uh, they, they, they would be a foreign organisation uh, in terms of this bill, and if a New Zealander was uh, working for that organisation, uh, and it was something that was a matter relating to international relations and the wellbeing of New Zealand or the economic wellbeing of New Zealand, then um, uh, they, they could apply for a warrant against the New Zealander. So the more... The more um, uh, important, if I could say it that way, uh, part of the powers against the New Zealander lies in Clause 55A. And this, uh, sir, has as a precondition that the matter has to be uh, necessary to contribute to the protection of national security and fall within a series of alternatives like terrorism, espionage. Now, I want to explain the evolution of that at Select Committee. Uh, the original um, form of the, the, uh, the way in which this was cast in the bill that went to Select Committee was as recommended by the Cullen Reddy report, um, but officials had, even at the time it was referred to Select Committee, identified that that might not be the best approach and had uh, said to submitters and to others, perhaps consider another approach. Uh, and at Select Committee, we learned that the problem with the approach which attempted to define national security was that things were covered and you could get warrants for that ought not to have been covered, and things that the agencies needed warrants for uh, weren't covered and they couldn't get warrants for. So it served neither to protect the public appropriately nor to empower the agencies appropriately. And so the advice from officials... Uh, um, uh, and uh, which, which the Select Committee tested very thoroughly, including by talking to um, the Privacy Commissioner, uh, the Inspector General uh, and various other submitters, was to move to a new definition, which in some ways is modelled on the approach that's taken on other, in other jurisdictions. For example, the United Kingdom doesn't try to define national security uh, and get themselves into that sort of straitjacket. Um, and takes an approach where the term national security is left undefined, which is what we've now gone for in this rendition in the bill as uh, coming back from Select Committee. Uh, but we have the additional protection that in order for the, you to get a Type 1 warrant against New Zealanders, it not, not only has to contribute to the protection of, of national security, it has to enable the assessment or protection against the harms that are set out in subsection 2, and I'm going to run through those, sir, because they're all very high-level um, uh, thresholds. The first is terrorism or violent extremism, and I accept that if there's a 
uh, threats to New Zealand involving terrorism or violent extremism, that it's appropriate that our GCSB and SIS agencies have the power to get a warrant against the New Zealander if it relates to national security and it relates, Mr. Chairman, the Honourable David Parker. and it relates to terrorism or violent extremism. The second uh, alternative is if it relates to espionage or other foreign intelligent activity that's directed a New Zealand interest, that's carried out by a person who is a New Zealand citizen or permanent resident, um, uh, and occurs in New Zealand. Uh, so that, again, that's quite a high-level test because it's got to be a matter of national security and espionage or other foreign intelligence activity of the type that I've just covered. The third um, example is national security and sabotage within the meaning of Section 79 of the Crimes Act. So if someone was going to plant an explosive device to blow up a dam or, you know, or cause some disturbance, I think that's serious enough for our agencies, um, uh, if it's a matter of national security, uh, to have some powers to get a warrant. Similarly, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, then the last one is the, uh, anything that may relate to a serious crime, and I'm going to come back to the definition of what's serious enough to really be a serious crime, um, but if it's a matter of national security and it's a serious crime that originates outside New Zealand or is influenced from outside New Zealand, so it could be some uh, in that case, it could be some uh, international drug syndicate or a um, people smugglers or something like that. Uh, or it involves um, the movement of money, goods or people. Actually, I probably should have mentioned people smugglers in, 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 in the second alternative. Uh, or it has the potential to damage New Zealand's uh, international relations or economic well-being. Then it can fit within that area. Now, the concept of economic well-being being used in respect of a warrant against the New Zealander has to be prescribed. This was one of the points that was made very clearly by um, Cullen and Reddy. But otherwise, uh, if you have a wide definition of economic well-being, anything would go, because you could virtually say anything um, relates to the economic well-being. But for that to apply here, it's first got to be a matter of national security. Secondly, it's got to be a serious crime as well as uh, uh, the, the, having the potential to damage New Zealand's international relations or economic well-being. Uh, and I think that's fair enough, so long as the threshold in respect of serious crime is high enough. The threshold in the bill, uh, as it came to Select Committee, and indeed as it leaves Select Committee, is a maximum term of imprisonment of two years, which I don't think is actually a proper definition of serious crime. I note that the definition in the search and surveillance legislation that came through this House actually has as a threshold five years. And I would have preferred a five-year definition. Um, the minister and the officials came to us and said, well, there are these series of crimes, including um, uh, uh, serious uh, crimes that could have an international dimension that ought to be caught that are less than five years maximum imprisonment but should nonetheless be caught. And the minister then offered a compromise of three years, um, which the Labor Party is, um, is uh, willing to accept because it's better than two years. Uh, we would have preferred five years. Um, uh, uh, we can't get five years because the government's not willing to agree it. It's, it is a matter of important detail, but nonetheless it's not going to um, mean that we vote against the whole of the bill, and so we're willing to accept the compromise uh, of three years, sir. So for that reason, the minister who has put forward in his supplementary order paper an amendment to the definition of a uh, serious crime to change the uh, provision from, uh, and the Minister will tell me if I've got this wrong, whether it's his supplementary order paper or another one. I think it is the Minister's supplementary order paper, that's the agreement we had. We'll change that from uh, two years to three years, sir. And on that basis, I think that um, we get the uh, limited circumstance in which these things can be used against New Zealanders right. Now, how is this an improvement against the status quo? We know from debates in respect of the GCSB that right at the end, on the final reading of that bill, the Prime Minister was reluctantly, I have to say, forced to uh, accept that under the GCSB legislation that was passed uh, as an interim measure following the dot-com fiasco, there was the ability to spy on New Zealanders in a rather unconstrained way, and the, Minister, uh, the Prime Minister said, don't worry about that, I won't operationalise it, which was, which was you know, better than nothing, but you're actually better to have these things appropriately prescribed by legislation rather than left to 
the will of a minister as to whether they will uh, inappropriately um, use the powers that have been granted by Parliament. We know that's not the right way to do it. We should have these rights constrained. And I think with these amendments, as recommended by the Select Committee, we get to that point. And accordingly, I'm in favour of part four of the bill. I, it's my intention to call Dr Kennedy Graham, but before I do, I, I do want to inform him so uh, he's not under a misapprehension and the House isn't, uh, that when we come to the vote uh, on his supplementary order paper, if in fact the House has agreed, as it is my expectation, to the Minister's supplementary order paper, his amendment to Clause 47 will at that point be out of order. Therefore, it's my intention to split his two amendments to this part, not to put the amendment to Clause 47, uh, but put the amendment to Clause 92. Now, I am, of course, anticipating what the House might do, uh, but I thought it's better to warn the member now uh, rather than have a fuss uh, at the later on. Dr Kennedy Graham. <coughs> Thank you.